This is the Amp Hour Podcast, released November 18th, 2019, episode 467, stories from Supercon 2019. I am at Supercon 2019, and I'm talking to Sprite. How are you doing, Sprite? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Good to talk to you again. We've had you on the show before. Yep. Um, and you did this badge. This thing is a, this thing is a work of art. I, I really like it. Yeah, it came out really well. Yeah. What was the, the genesis of, like, how did, how did it all start? So, um, as Mike said it, like in, at some point there was something in the air, seemingly multi pe- uh, multiple people already asked about, like, can we do a badge with an FPGA and maybe a RISC-V processor? And seemingly I was like in the third or fourth or something. And he was like, yeah, but, but you know, FPGAs are really hard. And, and are people at Supercon going to be able to... to to, to understand that, I mean, you always have a few people who, who just get it, but, and it actually took me um, uh, a prototype. I, I, I prototyped up a RISC-V emulator plus a little basic interpreter and some graphics bindings and effectively uh, programmed Pong in basic nice. on more or less a virtual imaginary badge. Uh-huh. And at that point he was like, yeah, if you can, if you can get that to work like in, in hardware then then we should be good so yeah at that point i started making the very first prototype uh, which i'm staring at right now it's yeah. uh, hand hand assembled you said you have a 100 percent success rate for yes yes i can like in all the bgas i soldered up to now i soldered successfully all one of them <laughs> good That's so good. and what is the processor that's or sorry what's the fpga that's on here uh it's a lattice ecp 545 Five, you something. Yeah. I saw you say forty-five thousand lots, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forty-five thousand okay. lots. Yeah, so. that's pretty sizable, right? I mean, you fit two two risk fives and a pick twenty-four in there. Yeah, plus plus uh, a graphics subsystem that's kind of sort of on par with a Super Nintendo, mm-hmm. plus an audio subsystem that's also pretty good. Uh, USB is in there. Um, uh, HDMI um, because of of course you put HDMI in there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I mean you gotta have a first on the batch. <laughs> <laughs> um, an interface to 16 megabytes of RAM. Well, there's a lot of stuff in there. Uh huh. Yeah, that's great. I mean, like, and I think it's just a that's a good measure of like how big it is in general, right? I mean, it's just a sizable. Oh, FPGA for sure. And, and 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 we're not even using all of it. The yeah. thing is like 61% full, if I recall correctly. Got it. Got it. You know, so I was I've been interested in this. I'm I'm kind of treating this weekend as like an opportunity to just try and get more tools in my toolkit. Right? Oh yeah. I think the open the Yosa stuff. We've had Clifford on the show. Uh, we've had Dave uh, FPGA Dave on the mm-hmm. show uh, briefly. And, you know, the whole team that's working on all that stuff is amazing. But I think that, like, just having these as a way to deploy custom logic fast, too. That's another thing. It's, like, so fast to get all this stuff uh, synthesized yep. and onto a thing. It's just, it feels like it feels like the future, you know? And oh, for sure. What, do you, what is your take on, like, where you see it going? Where I see it going, well, um, I kind of hope it just improves more and more. Um, uh, I think that that the team, like the idea of being the GCC for FPGAs, um, at least they're they're going pretty far in that direction with the amount of FPGAs they support. Yes. Uh, They always supported the ICE-40 series. They support the ECP-5 series. I think there's going to be a talk at the Supercon on how they support the uh, Silinx Series 7 FPGA series. Yep, yep. That's Tim Ansel. Yep. Uh, I, uh, I think there's already some work going on to uh, support like Chinese FPGAs, like the, the, the Go-In yeah, uh, I just, things. I just learned about those. I did not. I, those snuck up on me. I don't know where those came from, but <laughs> yeah, they've been around for a while. Uh, uh, the company itself has been around for a while. They're doing multiple things. Um, um, uh, I think those guys are also the guys who make the STM32 knockoffs and who make oh, the, uh, uh, like serial flash and stuff like giga, that. Giga devices. Giga devices. Yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah. Okay. 
So, which is another thing. And they make a make a risk five now too. Yeah, they do. Like I actually have one. core or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They effectively, at, at least it feels like they effectively took one of their their, their arm things, just ripped off the arm and and dumped a risk five yeah. in there. Yeah, that's great. Which is, I mean, valid. Yeah, yeah. And then you have similar registers and. Yep. See if it works. That's cool. That's mm -hmm. an interesting future in that way, right? Of like. Oh yeah. This kind of swappable hardware. There's, yeah, there's, there's. I, I, I can see multiple companies going that way. Just seeing, uh, you know, uh, if a Risk Five core makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Well, speaking of cores, I mean, what's been what's been going on? You're still at Espressive. Uh, yep. What's been going on with that? Uh, well, uh, let's see. This year we've had an IPO, which is good. Uh, I did not know that actually. Oh. Well, we did. <laughs> Are you rich now? <laughs> no, unfortunately well, not. Well, you know, there's still time. It's uh, true. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, there's, there's. Um, uh, we've also been been ramping up the CPUs. Uh, uh, sorry, the 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 chips we're making. We've we've been uh, developing a whole bunch of stuff in the in, in in the background for the last years. But it's already been a while since we introduced the ESP32. Mm -hmm. So we're like on the verge of introducing the ESP32 S2. Uh, mm -hmm. There's already some beta silicon out there. Mm. Um, uh, we should have the final silicon of that, I think, done. Uh, don't pin on, uh, don't pin me down on this, but I think at the start of the uh, of the next year. Oh, great. So, okay. um, yeah, and people were excited about that because it's got the USB in internal now, which is yes, like, definitely sure. can like simplify a lot of things. I entirely agree. It's um, uh, I've been I've been working on that like in a fair bit. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, just to have USB in there will probably simplify a whole bunch of designs. Right. Just literally like drop a chip now and it does all the things you... I was surprised that it went to single core, but that also helps with power and similar things. Yeah, well, it's 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 kind of... You, you got to know about the way this is this is put in the market. Like in... There's there's a whole bunch of manufacturers who think that the ESP thirty uh, sorry the ESP eight two sixty six is like in a bit old and a bit simple mm -hmm. and um, you know um, it's nice to add Wi Fi functionality to something but um, it's too simple to to uh, uh, be a standalone Wi Fi microcontroller for their purposes. Um, on the other hand, ESP32 is a beast with dual cores and lots of memory, etc., yeah. etc. It swung the hard the other direction, pretty much. Exactly. Yeah. So the ESP32 S2 is kind of a, an, an, an in-the-middle device. Uh, yeah. It has a, a little bit less RAM. Uh, it, it's only single core. Uh, obviously, there have been incremental up, updates to uh, to our IP as well. So it does get that. Uh, it's it's got USB. It's got a better PS RAM interface. Uh, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've upgraded SPI, um, uh, so there's a bunch of incremental updates there. But in general, the thing is positioned to be like in kind of sort of in between the A266 and the ESP32. Mm, great, that's great. So what about on the? Uh, oops, it's a little little loud out there. Yeah, yeah it is. we are we are in the. Uh, got a bunch of feedback during the. Uh, our survey this year, like, well, we like when we, you interview people on site, but it's, sometimes it's a little loud. It's like, oh, I know. Ah, I, yeah. Yeah, it's like we're trying to run away from people. We're actually luckily in an office right now. Yeah, this this actually really isolates well. Yeah. Um, well, okay, so, you know, your handle is Sprite, and there's mm -hmm. a lot of sprites on here. <laughs> I, I've i never really done graphics stuff before, and that's been, uh, there's been really good, like, getting, getting started docs and stuff like that. But what is, is do you have background in doing all this stuff? N well, um, uh, technically not. I've, I've I've been interested in a whole bunch of, of gaming systems and mm -hmm. and how they do things and you know how something. I mean, even a Super Nintendo only has a 16-bit CPU that runs at three-point spare change megahertz. Really, um, I didn't know that. So if you have graphics done the the like in naive way, but just having a frame buffer, like every single byte in, in, in memory um, uh, uh, equals a pixel in, in RAM. And first of all, you need a fair amount of RAM, at least at that time. And secondly, you need a fair amount of CPU power in order to push all those pixels. Right, right. So, and then it's just like, and it's like if the processor is doing it versus yep. um, having like a, a specific device that's Exactly. Dump it's, or something. So, so, so the specific device would be like in the graphics controller, uh, and um, uh, in both the 
the SNES case as well as on the batch case. It can do a whole bunch of stuff with regards to compositing and overlaying, etc. Mm. Uh, you indeed have a bunch of sprites uh, that you can just move around so you don't need to actually paint them because the graphics subsystem will take right. care of it. Yeah, so I guess when I think about, yeah, so like, okay, so we're going to say like it's a 16, 4 by 4 thing, mm -hmm. we're going to draw a checkerboard pattern, black, white, black, white, black, white, black, white, right? Yeah. So in a traditional system without sprites and stuff like that, you would actually have to then hold all that stuff in memory, know that you're changing bit number 14, and then go draw by bits 0 through 15 again, right? Yep. And so the sprite allows you to basically, how does, it, how does that work? And like, well, uh, a sprite wouldn't be a good, good, um, uh, a good fit for this. So uh, like, for instance, take, take, take the Mario game. Sure. Um, you've got most of your basic graphics 2D primitives uh, for a graphics subsystem around that age there. You've got your, uh, your, your background, your actual level. Um, that's all, uh, that's, that's large, as in um, uh, it's, it's larger than the screen. Yeah. And it consists of elements that are fixed. They, they won't move uh, um, uh, relative to each other. So yeah. it's, it's like actually the full a canvas of exactly what you could, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So you don't want to uh, have a full canvas image in memory because that yeah, would be right. way too big. Right. So what you do is you have tiles. The the, the that's uh, like in little images of uh, uh, in the case of the batch 16 times 16 pixels, mm -hmm. and you effectively assemble all those tiles in in a, ra a raster, so to say. So mm -hmm. by giving each position in the raster its own individual tile, um, you, can, you can draw graphics. So yeah. you will have, for instance, tiles that make up a cloud, tiles that make up, like in the, the, the pipes in Mario, you will have tiles that make up the ground. And you can effectively use those tiles to, to assemble a level. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so then you know that the level is this big thing, mm -hmm. but then it's, you basically are coding, like it goes tile one, Tile zero, tile zero, tile zero, tile two. Exactly. Okay. So the amount of memory you need to store is is only the memory for the unique bits of your graphics uh, plus how you repeat those in the level, so mm -hmm. to say. Okay. Uh, so that saves a lot of RAM and um, that also makes drawing it easier because it's effectively a level of indirection. Right. You basically uh, go out, grab that thing, bring it back. Yeah, more or less. Paste uh, it together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, those are tile layers. Uh, mm -hmm. On top of that, you have the smaller things that need to move independently. So, for instance, Mario, uh, like in any Goomba that uh, that pa passes along, uh, stuff like that. Those are sprites. Those are individual um, images. You, uh, usually tiles as well. So 16 times 16 mm -hmm. or whatever a fixed. Uh, uh, size, um, and you can effectively just give those a position um, independent independent of the grid that the rest of the level is on, and you can just place it. Mm. But the nice thing is that the actual drawing, again, the graphics hardware does that. So if you want to move Mario, then it would effectively be update the variable that states where the Mario right, sprite is. Yeah, is. Right. He's jumping, and so now it's position Y. It goes from 0 to 20 or whatever it is. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. if you do that, the hardware will take care of the rest. The CPU doesn't need to think about really? like in, oh, this is actually a Mario image. That's right. all right, the right. hardware that and does like, that. Do I draw a green pixel here, a red pixel? Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's oh. all hardware accelerated. Interesting. And that was happening back in the 80s yep. when the... That's, yeah, very much so. Uh, mm. They had to because uh, having enough memory to store the yeah. entire... Super expensive? <laughs> that that, that oh would God. cost an arm and a leg, That's for right. sure. Price fixing was a thing then. Uh, yeah, yeah, back in the day. Yeah. yeah. Big money. Big money. Yeah, I remember like opening up. Uh, I think it was a, a Game Boy, mm -hmm. and it's just like I think that one has a linear regulator on it, doesn't it? Uh, no, actually, the Game Boy has. Uh, so a switching regulator on there? Yeah, it's actually. A I remember there was board. one that had like a linear regulator. I was just like, whoa. There's 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 some in there, but the Game Boy is actually pretty uh, nice. It actually has a separate board made by Alps, if memory serves. That's mm -hmm. that's the switching r regulator. Mm, okay. It kind of needs that because it needs minus. Minus 20 volts or something for the for the display to work. Got it. Okay. So, um, uh, 
there were a few consoles that used the linear regulator. I think the at least the Atari 2600 used the linear regulator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as wall plugged at least though, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. That helps. I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if like in anything up to the SNES used a linear regulator because you know it wasn't that power right. intense. It's super cheap so, too. And yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, getting back to this thing, I mean, so uh, what was your experience with the uh, um, with the Risk Five and and the the ECP Five prior to this? Was it kind of just figured out as you went along, or uh, projects? yeah, I, I I had some like FPGA um, um, uh, experience, like in in general, I've I've messed around with FPGAs before, uh, never got around to building an entire SOC from the ground up, but, um, you know, um, um, uh, I, I knew my uh, VACL, I knew my Verilog, so um, that bit I had. The ECP5 I had no experience with, um, uh, like, the first prototype you see there is yeah. actually yeah. My, my, the, 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 the first uh, ECP5 board I own. Wow. Um, I, don't, I don't really... Well, that one worked, so I didn't right, need right. to buy an actual uh, like in dev kit for the ECP5. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, um, well, in the bitstream, so bitstream mm -hmm. for that, it went ICE40 was first, and then ECP5 was later. Yeah. How much after the time when the ECP, ECP5 bitstream was released that you started working on this? Um, it had been out for a while, or? I don't know. I, I think I made sure that it was more or less stable and usable. Um, but I don't exactly know the time span. It may have been a year or something, or okay. half a year. It's like, mm. yeah, pretty soon. But mm. yeah, most of it se seems supported and stable. Yeah. Um, to be fair, at that moment, it wasn't entirely like the, it's 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 nice how the tool chain just grows and 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 improves. Uh, like as as I went along that year, yeah, right, right, and there are still some things in the repo that are in there, but are actually workarounds for uh, things that the toolchain didn't do back then. Ah, really? <laughs> so yeah. I could have I could actually delete them and, and fix those in the in in the more obvious way. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's great. And then so it has two risk fives in there. Why mm -hmm. why does it have two risk fives and a pick twenty four? Uh, Pick 16 actually. Oh, Pick 16. Oh, I thought uh, it was 24. Okay. It's it's the 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 old school Pick 16 C84. Got it. So the two risk fives are in there because um, uh, why did I put two risk fives in? Oh yeah, I know. So um, the risk five core that's in there is a Pico RV32 core. Um, it's a really nice core. It's written in pure Verilog. It's uh, formally verified. It's mm -hmm. used all over the place. So yep. that's like, the one that uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, yeah, did, right? yeah, exactly. Yeah. So formally verified, probably because of symbiosis. symbiosis oh yeah, for sure. Right at EDA. But it's it's like really nice and simple. And my idea for the batch would be that it's something that people should be able to hack. And if I use like in three different high high level languages only for the FPGA load then um, it's probably going to be too much for people to, to just try to read up in, in one weekend so mm -hmm. I wanted to have something that's 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 very log based and, and is simple and and you know there's there's some documentation out there so Pico RV32 problem with the Pico RV32 is that it's um, well, the implementation as is on the on the FPGA is slow. Um, mm. It's a CPU that is meant to have a high um, high high clock uh, clock speed, and in yeah. this in this FPGA, it it only gets like in a medium clock speed. But in order to get a high clock speed, like in the trade-off is that it has a lot of cycle per instruction. Um, so even something as simple as a load that takes like three or four cycles, okay. uh, where where most normal uh, CPUs would take give or take one cycle per instruction. Mm. So there's a lot of slowdown, and that causes the memory bus, for instance, not to be utilized to the uh, to the maximum. So my idea was, okay, I'll just plunk in a second risk five core because the memory bus can handle it, and mm -hmm. and that way we get twice the speed. Yeah, <laughs> right. And so. I remember you were showing. So you were showing this morning. You were showing some of the, the gotchas and like how the access works. And I remember you said that there was, you said there was the four byte, four bit access to the bus, but that was because of thirty two bit. Wide. Yeah, there's. Uh, well, that's 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 actually a standard thing. It's just something that you need to know about the bus. Like, mm. the RISC five is a thirty two bit processor, so it has a thirty two bit uh, bus to the memory, mm -hmm. but. 
it can, I mean, obviously it can also read and write 16 and 8-bit values. Sure. And the way it implements it is it'll send a 32-bit value over, but it'll tell you using uh, the write stroke, oh, I only want to write this mm -hmm. byte of the 32-bit value. You can ignore the rest. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the trick, more or less. Right, so instead of doing masking or... Exactly, anything, exactly. Yeah, that helps yeah. with instructions. And yeah. So uh, I remember something about in that part you were talking about, though, there was something that felt like it was like two 32-bit, it was like a two reads or two writes. Or, I thought there was something in there. Is that how they're talking on the bus or is there a... Yeah, there's, there's, there's <laughs> actually where you would normally, if you go back to the Z80 days and stuff, mm -hmm. you would only have one bus and that would be bidirectional. So okay. if you read from a peripheral, the data go, goes over the same bus as if you write to a peripheral, mm -hmm. which is really nice, but um, FPGAs, uh, well, it needs tri-stating. Like mm -hmm. uh, yeah. if, 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 if one, one uh, uh, if, if, if the CPU speaks, then the peripherals should, should shut up and tri-state their bus. That's right. Yeah. Um, but FPGAs don't really do that, um, at least not nowadays. There used to be Silinx processors way, way back that could do that, but because of a variety of reasons, they don't do that anymore. So um, uh, a lot can only have uh, an output or only have an input. Um, so in order to make that work, you need two buses, like in one bus from the master to all the peripherals, and then from all the peripherals, there's like in a separate bus that goes into a, a multiplexer that goes back into the master, mm. just because you can't do that. Got it, got it. That's cool, okay. So uh, what else should we know about the badge? I mean, there's gonna be obviously a lot of hacking that happens over this weekend. Oh, sure, it's, yeah, it's like, it's, it's really open. It's, uh, uh, people can hack so much with it from, from the hardware. I mean, you can solder to the batch, obviously. Yeah. Oh, the more. cartridge thing, that's a cool Yeah, 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 yeah. Of... yeah, we have a nice cartridge. Uh, it's so actually... it looks, to explain what it looks like maybe too, that helps for people listening. <laughs> yeah, audio only, right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> so uh, the cartridge is a, is a, um, a PCB that, that slots into the back of the, uh, uh, of the batch. Uh, like the batch kind of looks like a Game Boy and the cartridge would be like the cartridge as in the game cartridge. Mm -hmm. um, the cartridge that you get with the batch is effectively a prototyping board. So it has uh, lots, of, uh, lots of pads in there that are connected and you can just solder your own random stuff on there. Mm -hmm. um, and it also has a little bit of flash uh, on there. I really like that. And it shows up, also it enumerates and shows up on when you plug in the USB. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's super easy to just drop an application on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the entire idea was that like previous years, um, the batches varied a little bit in programmability. Uh, mm -hmm. They went all the way from, uh, I think, the, the first or the second batch, also just enumerated as a USB mass storage device. Mm -hmm. yeah. But later on, either you needed a PIC kit or okay. something else, and, and I never really liked that. I mean, mm -hmm. especially since I'm also a Linux user and most of that embedded stuff That's tends right. to be slightly Windows focused. Yeah. It's getting uh, better, honestly. Like it's A lot of the tools are getting better. Uh, true, true, true. Yeah. It's still not entirely there, though. Yeah, I agree. So I was like, for the Batch, simple and stupid. There are USB protocols that are like standardized. So you have DFU for the low level uh, stuff that you want to update. Mm -hmm. And for the rest, there's a file system. Uh, if you plug the batch in, you just, it looks like a USB stick. Tiny USB stick, but yeah, still a right, USB yeah, stick. Yeah, yeah. And like, oh, 14, 14 megabytes, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and the cartridge, uh, yeah, just enumerates as a second USB stick. And you can just drag and drop your files uh, and, and, and your programs onto there. Mm -hmm. And the idea of also putting some memory on the cartridge is that, well, first of all, even if you if you don't use the um, uh, use the prototyping space, it's probably fun just to be able to give your your game or your whatever to someone else by just yeah. passing the cartridge. Yeah, that's totally awesome. Uh, but also, if you do uh, put stuff on there, uh, say like in the canonical example would be if you were to put, for instance, a bunch of uh, DACs on there and a front end to 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 make a scope. Um, mm. You can put both the bitstream that has the interface to the DACs, like in, in hardware, mm -hmm. uh, you can put that on the flash, plus you can put the application that actually shows you the scope user interface, you can put that on the mm -hmm. flash. And that way you can turn any random batch into a scope by just inserting the cartridge and, yeah. and booting from the cartridge. Right, so it makes the, makes the entire thing, the entire badge is reconfigurable with, yep. with a cartridge. Exactly. Which is pretty crazy. Yep. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, that'll be interesting to see what people do with that. Yeah, I haven't got time for it, but one of the things you could do is, for instance, take, uh, there's some IP out there, for instance, from people who converted, like in a Game Boy to Verilog, so you can put it in an FPGA. Mm -hmm. uh, theoretically, what you could do is build a, an interface cartridge with the, uh, uh, with the cartridge connector for the badge on one side and uh, an interface for a Game Boy cartridge on the other side. And if you slot it in and then slot a Game Boy cartridge in there, you like effectively a cartridge can... cartridge cartridge kind of thing? Exactly. And, yeah. and, and, and then you can play that Game Boy game because yeah. the FPGA all of a sudden becomes a Game Boy and right. it can read the original Game Boy cartridge right. through the, the interface logic. Right. And in theory, if there was a Sega um, Game Gear yeah. Verilog, you could then plug in a different cartridge. Exactly. It then becomes a Game Gear yeah. and you could play a Sonic or whatever. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's... It's, you know, it's really hard... I remember the first time I started like learning and thinking about FPGAs. It's so hard to visualize at first, you know, and it's it's hard to remember what that feeling is like, especially coming from like a microcontroller background yeah. and things like that. Yeah, you... it's so flexible. Yeah, I I, I I I actually have one line in the in in the very log code that I that I really like. Um, it's it's something like a parameter CPU count equals two, um, and the nice thing is that. Um, if you look at that line naively without knowing anything about programming, then you make a certain assumption. And then if you know how to program, you're like, nah, that's probably wrong. That's just a constant for something. Yeah. But in this case, your initial assumption would actually be right. If I put a three in there, uh -huh. there, would, there would be an extra core that shows up in the FPGA. Oh, really? Yes. It's just a literally just a variable it, 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 it literally sets the amount of course that you have in your SOC right and it errors out when you put in 64 because you well yeah big, you right? wouldn't have the, the, the space yeah. and, 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 and in general uh, like above a certain certain count it doesn't make sense because the memory bus gets so constrained that all the CPUs are waiting on each other but right, you know right. but in theory I mean like that's the flexibility of it all yeah right, right. yeah just the fact that you can write such a line and it does actually what you <laughs> might think that's it might trippy. do it's, it's weird yeah I mean well I mean the idea of like if you say you could take it to a large number, right, mm -hmm. and they actually did work, and you had the memory for it and everything, like then it, you have that many CPUs, you basically become a GPU, right? And that kind of like the idea of like, I mean, in theory of like having lots of parallel yeah, 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 for capabilities. Sure. Yeah, stuff. you can do that. Yeah. So that's yeah. It's just there's the, the parallel nature of it. Like that's one thing that I think is is hard was always hard for me to wrap my head oh, around. Oh yeah, for sure. And then and that's I always try and like talk about like streaming data and like thinking about like like putting data through a pipe, but then there's like little release valves and it, you know, it's trying to do stuff as it's yep. still streaming. It has to still be moving through the pipe. Yeah, it's, 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 it's more like mechanics than it is like programming, actually. Yeah, right, it's right. The, the, the way everything it's happens in parallel. It's a Rube Goldberg gotta, machine, right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Continuous Rube Goldberg machine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's tough to think about, but then I think the, the, the fact that then, okay, then they're also able, you're also able to put logic on there that, you know, is a CPU. It's mm -hmm. like another, another yeah. layer. I finally remembered what the name of the. Uh, I used to work on the Microblaze. Do you ever use those? Oh the, yeah, that's Xilinx, Xilinx right? Yeah, that's yeah, Xilinx, and the Neos is the Altera one. Someone was talking yeah. about earlier, and uh, they're always like they're. It's been possible for a while to do this kind of thing. Like, oh yeah, it's not certainly. like it's a new thing, but yeah, it feels like this is better. So, some way, you know? so the nice thing about Risk Five, uh, like there have been, if you if you go to opencores.org, you can download like in CPUs in all shapes and forms. Yeah, you, you get, get an M zero, right? You can get you like get, a... uh, nowadays you can get an M zero. Yeah. Um, but at least before Risk Five was there, um, I feel it was really hard to get an IP that was unencumbered by, if I use this in a product that grows anywhere near big, then I will have mm -hmm. Intel or ARM or whatever, yeah. open Sending a can of lawyers. That's and, right. uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, or or was actually usable. Like yeah, you would have a few CPU cores that were really nice, but they were made by one random guy who also developed the ISA and there is a GCC, you know, fork that never has been mainlined, that has been updated like 10 years ago. That's right, yeah. Uh, that, 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 that's all, you know, those were the choices you had. Or like the third choice was to go with something antique like a Z80. Right, and, right. Um, 8051 with, you know, hope, hopefully, again, the GCC is all yeah. set up for it. And, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, but the thing that RISC-V 
has done is um, allow, um, so just as a user, what I see is that there's an explosion of RISC-V processors in all shapes and forms from, from really small to, to, to really large. And most of them I can just download and plunk in my design. And all of them are RISC-V. So I can just go and download the RISC-V uh, GCC thing, which is actively being developed on by a lot of people, which is stable, which is um, you know solid, well defined and open, and yeah, exactly. And 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 because everything is open and just given away for free, I don't have to worry about like in a can of lawyers uh, uh, ending up <laughs> at my front door. Yeah. So right. that's that's the big advantage that I think Risk Five has. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's like agency, and it's also like uh, yeah, yeah, freedom to. Yeah, for sure. It. Yeah. It's it's. Yeah, you get choice, you get uh, like in the freedom to pick something because there are actually multiple choices there and, and you get good tool chain support. Yeah, and I think that's another thing too, is like having focus too of like having focus from the community, having you know people working on it. Mm -hmm. It's like this weird kind of like buzz that's kind of like behind you like, oh, well, it's probably going to be okay versus like, yeah. you know, like otherwise it's like you talk to a bunch of vendors and then it's like a feeling of like, well, it seems like they're supporting their customers and I'm paying a lot to pay for their support and you know like yeah, it's it's like in the, you know, the other thing is that it's not 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 unpre unprecedented that for instance a an architecture has been mainlined in GCC and then drops out because you know there's there's no one around and, yeah. yeah exactly and, and 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 the manufacturer doesn't really care about the CPU thing so it doesn't send any patches and it yeah. kind of sort of erodes away and at some point the maintainers just go like yeah it's not right. going to be in the next release right right it's a, a natural selection for for processors yeah more or less <laughs> yeah that's crazy well, Sprite, thank you for this great badge. This has been great. It's good to see you. It's good hearing about uh, everything you're doing. And yeah. uh, thanks for telling us about the badge. Hey, you're welcome. <laughs> Hello. We're back from a, in a very quiet room at, uh, at Supply Frame during uh, Supercon 2019, thankfully. And I'm here with... Uh, Sylvain Minot. Welcome, Sylvain. How are you doing? Uh, and what are, what are you working on here? Um, so I'm doing uh, great at the moment. And I'm helping with the FPGA badge workshop. Um, that are you know helping people hack on the the this, brand new FPGA. This uh, thing is beautiful. It's really it is. Nice. It's really nice. Yeah, and it's very powerful as well. So yeah. Well, so we just I just talked to Sprite. I just okay. did an interview with him, and uh, it's big. I mean, like forty five thousand lutz is like not a small part. No, no, it's definitely um, a very decently sized FPGA, um, and half of it is still free despite everything we've crammed yeah. on it. So yeah. which means that if people want to do like advanced applications, stuff like that, mm -hmm. they won't run into um, like space limitation yeah. anytime soon. And you did the, uh, the DFU for this thing? So yeah, uh, so what I did for this badge is uh, the DFU bootloader. Um, what does DFU stand for? Oh yeah, so it's, uh, the DFU is a device firmware upgrade, I think, mm -hmm. uh, which is just a standard way to um, upload new firmwares onto the badge, basically. So it's the what allow people to replace the FPGA bitstream and the um, the uh, soft core application that is running on the badge mm -hmm. with hopefully minimal risk of actually breaking the badge and, and needing yeah. a JTAG adapter to yeah. restore it. Uh, that's that's good. Yeah, I think I, I've used some particle devices that have that. There's a bunch of devices that are in the market that have that, but it's like, hold a button, it goes into some blinky mode, and you're like, okay, now we're good. To, exactly, yeah. yeah. yeah and, good. Uh, so what did that take to actually write that for, for this uh, scenario? Well, um, not that much because I, so I had previously written a, a USB device core for FPGA, which uh -huh. is actually the device, the USB core, which is used in the main firmware as well. Okay. Um, and so I already had uh, this uh, USB core and a DFU enabled firmware for another device for an uh, ICE40 uh, FPGA. Oh, okay. And so I mostly had just to, you know, adapt a few things for the ECP5. Um, and then try to optimize it for the badge, uh, basically make it faster. Okay. Try, try to minimize the, uh, the flash time, basically. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. So, so this is like a piece of IP that you had that you use on other projects. Yes. And it was repurposable. Yeah, yeah. So what does that process look like? Because like, that is kind of the promise of, I mean, I guess that's the promise of even C and writing, you know, being able to, you know, retarget devices and, you know, port stuff, but like, FPGAs kind of take that to another level. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So what it took uh, in this specific instance um, is there are a few um, 
so you, you described your you know your uh, the, the, your hardware in uh, HDL, right? Mm -hmm. In this case, Verilog. Um, most of it is generic, and uh, the synthesis tool is going to do the work of translating that generic description into uh, hardware specific um, primitives. Uh, but for some of them, um, the tool isn't really ready yet to do it perfectly, and so you help him. You help the tool by instantiating primitives. Uh, in this case, the, the two things that were instantiated manually were um, block RAMs. So in the FPGA, you have a, a, like a small amount of RAMs um, that you can use. They're really small memory, like 4 kilobits or, or 16 kilobits and that kind of stuff. And these are uh, vendor specific. Um, right. And so I just had to replace the specific primitive that I was using in the, for the ICE40 by the equivalent for the ECP5. Um, when you say primitive, is this almost like a reserved word in C or something? Yeah, like exactly. That, right? it's, it's, like, uh, it's like a magic word to just so use what the Xilinx version is or the Lattice version it's, is. Right? It's basically uh, like, you know, Verilog is uh, it's a bunch of modules that you connect together, right? And you describe those modules. And some some of these modules, you actually they are actually like black boxes uh -huh. that will just get converted to actual blocks in the hardware. Yeah, that, right. They, they're just there; they exist. Right. Yeah, you, you it's don't like have an to API them. for existing hardware. Exactly. Yeah. And so, the kind of hardware block that you would find in the FPGA are well, mostly the RAMs. You also have like a DSP block, like yeah, hardware Mac, multipliers. Max, right. yeah, I remember yeah, those. Yeah, exactly. yeah, multiply, accumulate. Multiply, right? accumulate. Yeah. Um, and and the other one that I had to deal with here is the I/O blocks, like mm -hmm. how to talk to the outside world mm -hmm. is often sp um, specific to a, to an FPGA family. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really minor adaptations, um, and yeah, and the rest was, you know, dealing with the specificity of the badge, like which pin is you know connected yeah, to the right, flash, right? The mapping to the exactly. kind of that it is. Yeah, uh, mostly it's dealing with the external external. Uh, World, basically. Right, whatever Sprite decided the pin would be hooked yeah, up to. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah, and the, uh, what's the other one? Oh, Certus is the other one that I've, I've, I think I've worked on in the past. Isn't that like usually like a targetable block? Like a, a Which one? S E R D E S, a serial. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's serial. That's actually that's that's really part of the I.O. Yeah. Like, oh, most, right, most, yeah. of the, most of the time, the I.O., they can, um, you know, just take a signal and, and put it to the outside, or they can also um, have a flip-flop directly inside the I.O. to kind of guarantee the the, uh, the timing, you know, so you, you have guaranteed a setup at all times, right. uh, that kind of stuff. And then sometimes you want to take multiple bits and serialize them very fast. So you input eight bits, and then the, the I.O. block will basically serialize them into uh, eight sequential bits for you. That's the service that's kind of stuff. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, that's great. That's great. That's what's used on the batch for the HDMI, for instance. I think. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so you do you do this professionally too? Yes. Yes, I do that. Um, that's actually my my first job was uh, doing FPGA stuff. Okay. Um, so. I've so in a commercial context, I mean, we don't need to talk about the specifics of your companies, but like they. Uh, but do you use the open tool chains for that, or what is um, what is your take on the industry in, in F, with FPGAs? So. At the moment, uh, I don't use this, the, the open toolchain uh, synthesis uh, for my work because I mostly work on Xilinx and the toolchain sure. is currently not, yeah. not there, not in a state that I, yeah, I can uh, uh, use it professionally. I do use um, Iverilog, for instance, like for simulation. Mm -hmm. um, I use that because, well, honestly, model sim just costs too much money. Yeah, true. <laughs> and Iverilog is perfectly suitable for my needs, and so I use that. Um, but if I, um, the state of the tool chain for the ICE40 and for the ECP5 is starting to reach a point where it would actually be usable for uh, a, a, some commercial projects. Right. So um, if you had a commercial project that was yeah. had a lattice part on it, then. there are there are you know something it doesn't handle yet um, perfectly. Um, mostly there are very advanced features like dealing with multiple. Cro uh, Multiple clock domains. You have to be able to cons constrain yeah. uh, the the paths between different clock domains. At the moment, the tool will report them, but doesn't allow you to constrain them. Uh -huh. And the other thing is I/O timing. Uh, okay. So when you have a signal inside the FPGA, you need to know, you know how many nanoseconds it's going to get to the outside. Yep. Uh, that kind of stuff uh, when you're talking with uh, high-speed interfaces. Um, and for that step, we actually still have to. Um, rely either on the proprietary tools um, mm -hmm. or just open take a shot yeah, yeah exactly yeah, right that's that's a tough tough selling business right where you're like no yeah. this, need, this needs to work yeah exactly yeah yeah it's true hmm. 
Well, uh, it's interesting. Like at, one of the things that's going to be happening this weekend is Tim's going to give a talk about uh, Tim Ansel. Yeah, will be giving a talk about the Xilinx Spartan yeah, yeah. Seven is uh, or Seven Series. I don't actually know. So, yeah, the Seven Same Series. Thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I think or the architecture for the Seven Series is pretty similar. Okay. And so I think they're targeting one specific part at the moment, but uh, most of it will be applicable to translate. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Okay. Huh. So, what does it look like then when you're um, so now you're switching back and forth between like open tools and yeah. you know, proprietary tools. What does that look like then for you? Is it, is it kind of just you're used to it or what does that feel like? Yeah, I'm kind of used to it because um, ever since I've been uh, using the, so I'm using mostly the Xilinx tools uh, for uh, sure. my work, but I never use the GUI. Like, oh, no. uh, okay. my, my flow was always make file based mm-hmm. and using the command line tool and stuff like that. So except for the fact that um, it takes a little more time to build. Uh-huh. Uh, it's pretty much the same. Like I just type make. Uh, yeah. at, at the end, I've got my bitstream, right? Yeah. It's yeah. just, uh, yeah. I the only don't. Yeah, I need a license basically. That's that is sure. And right. I need to download like what eighty gigabyte, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but other than that, it's it's fairly similar um, at the moment, at least for me. Mm-hmm. It, it the setup is much. You know, if you start from nothing. It's much easier with the open source uh, tools, I think, uh, because getting a working makefile based flow for the um, the proprietary tool was uh, yeah took some time at the beginning, but now I have it and it, right. it works. Um, if you're familiar, if you're familiar with uh, Tickle, it might actually be easier for you to use Xilinx because everything is Tickle based. That's right. So. Yeah, yeah. It kind it's of depends. TCL for people that haven't oh, seen yeah, that yeah, before. Right, yeah. yeah, it's. I remember the first time it was like TK TCL. What what the <laughs> hell is this? You know. Yeah. And uh, but that's like the scripting language exactly, that a lot yeah. of the everything FPGA is based. Uh, and it's. Yeah. It's, it's like a hold. It's not a holdover, but it's just a. It's the chip industry in general uses it a lot. I think. I think yeah. so. I mean, yeah. I, I'm not. I've only been in the chip industry starting with Xilinx, mm-hmm. so I've only done then. But I've been told that yeah, it's uh, like a historic. Yeah. Uh, thing that uh, just continues yeah. up to today. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, there's so much invested yeah. uh, stuff there, so that makes sense. True. So when I saw I saw you at uh, CCC Camp, or CC Camp, I guess, um, you were doing some Osmocom stuff there, too. Um, uh, yes. Oh, this camp? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we saw each other there. Yeah, briefly, sure, yeah, yeah of course. Briefly. Yeah. I think you were working on some of the um, the cell service stuff, right? That was there. Yes. So, uh, well, I wasn't directly involved in running the cell serv- uh, the cell service at a, uh, at camp that was handled by uh, another team. Uh-huh. Um, I was just working on different uh, projects. Actually, one of the projects I'm working on at the moment for Osmocom uh-huh. is sort of related with the CP5. It's, oh, yeah. uh, we're trying to use the CPRI radio heads. I don't know. Uh, that so, um, in modern s- cell networks you will have uh, what's called the radio head, which is basically the uh, software-defined radio that you're gonna mount near the antenna. Oh, okay. And then it has like a fiber connection to the baseband unit, which does all the protocol stuff. Oh, okay, okay. And So it's basically one, piping already encoded data. Exactly, it's, it's piping IQ data, basically okay. uh, through fiber. Oh, wow. Um, and then the, the, radio. the amplification and all the, yeah. the putting it into amplifier, well, I guess that whole signal chain is, is the radio head. Exactly. Okay. And so we're trying to use those radio heads on, the, on the, their own and talking to them uh, using an, uh, an ECP5. Wow. Um, and CPRI is, is, is the standard to do that. And it, it specifies a standard um, like sample format for the IQ data. Mm-hmm. But of course, there is also the encapsulated vendor specific commands. Okay. Because um, like to start up the radio at Talib, uh, what power to transmit, uh, what frequency to transmit on, huh. all of that is not specified. Which we, knew we actually need to find a way to sniff a multi-gigabit link <laughs> to uh, see exactly how the... Right, because right. you the could just copy radio. the packets you're saying. Yeah, exactly. We need to see what they are first. We, we have both sides yeah. and we're trying to basically sniff the, oh <laughs> the link God. in between using the ECP5. It, for that gig- gigabit link, though. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it, the ECP5 has a variant uh, with gigabit transceivers, uh-huh. and so we basically plug uh, one SFP on one side, one SFP on the other, plug both. And that's the theory. I mean, at the moment, we haven't actually tried it yet. Yeah. We're, we're, we're trying to get the uh, the SETS up and running with wow. the correct rate and everything to yeah. get the link up. But that's, wow. Uh, and uh, sorry, SFP is what? SFP is uh, like a small factor. Pluggable. It's like those small fiber modules, like okay. that, that are standard. Okay. That you just plug off the uh, shelf. Kind of yeah, thing. they're off the shelf thing. You can buy them for like five bucks on oh, eBay. Wow. Okay. 
they, they take the electrical signal and convert it to the optical huh. thing. Cool. That's great. Man, how'd you get involved in that? Uh, oh, wow, I can't remember. Uh, in Asmocom or in, the, in, the, in that uh, particular? As- well, either one, yeah. yeah. So um, that particular project, honestly, I don't remember. Um, I think I was just curious about how the CPRI radio heads work because they, they became... They're, they're great radios because they they have like uh, <laughs> powerful amplifiers, yeah. great filters. Like a, it's a very good hardware. Yeah, that sounds like you, you could do any. I mean, the, software defines you could do a lot yeah, of things with it, and right? you can buy them used for like two hundred bucks or something. Oh wow! Yes, and for that you get like an eighty watt amplifier that can transmit with oh, wow yeah, in like it's multi insane. gig kind of like multi yeah. gigahertz kind of yeah exactly that's wow. uh, with like a wide bandwidth I think the some have like up to 80 <laughs> you could really bandwidth. make the FCC upset <laughs> <laughs> yes possibly I mean it's good you don't I mean yeah, but, but, but uh, yeah our goal is obviously to be able to use those radio heads with the the open source base station we have for GSM right. LTE yep, yep. like uh, SRS LTE that kind yeah. of stuff yeah because um, yeah, if people don't know at uh, KS Camp and then one year at Tour Camp I think as well yeah. They have, I mean, maybe at Congress, too, do they have this? At uh, Congress, we do GSM, yeah. Too. Yeah, yeah, so it's like a totally on its own network, right? Yeah, yeah. we, we run a uh, um, GSM network for several years. Uh, for a couple of years now, we uh, also run a 3G network. Mm-hmm. And for the first time at uh, camp this year, we actually ran an LTE network yeah. in addition. So we had 2G, 3G, and 4G coverage that's, at the camp. That's trippy, uh, man. Using... Um, yeah, open source uh, software. Yeah, uh, but not 5G because, in not, my opinion, 5G doesn't exist yet. Well, I haven't, I haven't, yeah, I haven't seen anything yet. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I just love <laughs> 5G. Yeah, yeah, it just doesn't exist. It's just not a thing yet. I know it's a thing, but like, I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. Right. Right. Works. Right. right. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's cool though. Um, so, uh, oh, I lost my train of thought already. Uh, Osmocom, oh, that was what it was. So Osmocom, I had first been introduced to that through, I think HackRF also ties into that. Uh, so, wait. So, I mean, there was some a, of like the, I okay, think maybe so it's the, the receiver. They have a driver The, the driver, Osmocom. so the, the story behind uh, that is a, it's a little funny. So a, a long time ago, um, some people in Osmocom, they, we wanted to make like a very cheap receiver-only SDR. Okay. That, that was called Osmo SDR. Okay. And that was uh, like a, an arm with an external ADC and an Elonix tuner or something. Yeah. And we've, we were working on that, the firmware for it and a GNU radio driver for it. Mm-hmm. And not long after, I mean, not actually at the same time, like roughly the same, sure, in the sure. same time frame, um, uh, Steve, uh, Steve McGrath uh-huh. um, actually... Uh, you know, made um, RTL SDR, basically. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so it's like finding those yeah, exactly. the, the and so tuners. And at that point, that kind of made the Osmo SDR project a little bit irrelevant because right. there was no way we were going to compete in price. 20 bucks or whatever uh, it is. With, yeah, with, with, with so, that. Yeah. And although the the receiver was better, sure. the ratio, you know, price performance wasn't uh, quite there, so that... Uh, yeah, excess, I mean, like even just a distribution kind of thing, yeah, where you exactly. have all of these TDB exactly. tuners that are out and there. They, at, at the time, they were using, the ATLSD, yeah, were using the same t- tuner, the E4000, that yeah. we were using. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Really. So, um, so, yeah, in the end, uh, um, the, the, the GNU radio driver that we made, that was called GR Osmo SDR, uh-huh. Um, uh, Dimitri Stolnikov uh, basically added an option in it so that it could use either the Osmo SDR hardware or the RTL SDR. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and then, then you some, let some, the some public people, decide. <laughs> yeah, and then people started using that in the radio project, right? Uh-huh. To interface with the hardware. Yeah. And then some other SDR came out, I think uh, possibly the Acura F right after. Yeah. And to be able to reuse all the same right. uh, flow graphs and applications that were already existing. They just added it's a thing. Acura support into yeah. GR or small SDR. Yeah. And then basically every SDR that came after that Yep. They just yeah, Lime added, and exactly. all of those. They were but all... it always kept the name GR Osmo SDR, and that's good. That's branding, right there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, and what's funny is that for a long time, I don't know if it still does that, but for a long time, like when you install it with the uh, GNU Radio uh, like installer or the, it actually still pulled the the library and driver for the Osmo SDR hardware. Oh yeah. That five people in the world have <laughs> <laughs> but everybody has support for it yeah that's so. great well you know if it ever makes a resurgence you know it'll be yeah 
smart people just target it and pretend it's that thing, and then it's good to good to and go. That's, uh, yeah, that's pretty much the tie between. So, uh, what what is Osmo come in the first place? I don't actually know oh, the, so, the genesis of the group. So it kind of started with um, Harald Well and Dieter Parr. like um, I think it was at uh, our. So the uh, uh, hacking at random, I think it's 2009 or something. Okay. They they created this project called OpenBSC, which was using the BS11 base station okay. to run the first like open source based GSM network at a hacker conference. Um, it was r- kind of you know compared to what we have today, it was really primitive code, and sure. it was barely initializing the BTS and allowing calls or SMS. I don't. I wasn't there, so I, I don't sure. remember. Um, and then meeting up with um, with Harald, uh, I think I met him at 2063 at the Congress. Um, wow, that's almost 10 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Does that make okay. you feel old? I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it keeps hitting me that, you know, with 2020, like, creeping around the corner, yeah. I'm like, oh, I was like, you know, remember when they were playing Prince's 1999 and where everyone's like, oh, God, this song is so old. That was 20 friggin' years ago, you know? Uh, <laughs> just like, oh, yeah. God. <laughs> Anyways, sorry. Go, go on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, so, yeah, I met him there, and um, we, I started working on OpenBSC and, you know, improving things and adding support for uh, other features. I don't remember exactly what I, what I worked on at, the, at that time. Uh-huh. And another project was started uh, that was targeting the kind of the other side, which is like making an open source baseband firmware, sort of the phone side. Yeah. Uh, and at that point, uh, we were looking for uh, for a name, kind of uh, to, to put all of these like uh, open source telecom project uh, under like an umbrella brand. Uh-huh. And we came up with the name uh, Open Source Mobile Communication, which is like Osmocom. Yeah, okay. And that's, that's where the name came from. And yeah. originally it was like Open BSC and then uh, Osmocom BB, that right. ba- Osmocom base band. Right. And then other projects came and uh, were added on top and under the same umbrella. Uh-huh. Yeah. Now if you go to osmocom.org, you have like a bunch of yeah. uh, projects. The, the most active ones are still the GSM and core network kind mm-hmm. of uh, yeah. things. But we have... Uh, we worked on Tetra. We worked on GMR one, which is like satellite phones. We uh, cool. worked on a bunch of. Uh, um, it's always interesting stuff. to me because it's like, it feels like telecom is such a closed off industry. Obviously, there's people working on it, but yeah. like the people that are willing to talk about it and like it feels like a ton of reverse engineering because you have to. You're not going to get someone to be like, "Hey, what were you doing there?" No, I'm not telling you that. <laughs> that was actually one of the goal of uh, of Harald is that uh, um, he. There was a lot of people working on, you know, um, like Wi-Fi stuff, basically, like Wi-Fi yeah. security and that kind of stuff, and yeah. nobody looking at uh, a ton of other telecom protocol that are used by, you know, millions, billions of people. Of course, yeah. Uh, and nobody was looking at them. And I remember that so first the point, year, this, the 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 towers got spoofed at DEF CON or something like that. Everyone's like. What? Oh no! You can you can get you our can cell phones yeah. too. <laughs> A lot of things that people don't realize, and uh, and so yeah, the, the, I think the goal was mostly to get people to uh, looking at that uh, yeah. because a lot of those protocols they're not actually um, more complicated or um, secure. Uh, or secure yeah. or and a lot of them are actually documented like because you have yeah. to have interoperability and between and thing you can actually uh, most of the time the standard are available freely sometimes you have to like buy them but it's just like uh, a few hundred bucks and oh really okay like it's uh, like standards body that you buy from yeah exactly it's, it's, you have to it's, interpret it's not, the legalese or whatever's in there right yeah that kind of stuff yeah uh, I, I'm not yeah I don't really look at the details you don't read that, that for that fun on like no. a weekend or <laughs> not really <laughs> um, and so yeah that, that was really the goal is to basically encourage people to look at um, that kind of stuff and provide tools to be able to analyze them right? yeah. because previously for GSM like if you wanted to to like uh, fuzz your um, Wi-Fi card, you know you could find like monitor firmware or that kind of stuff uh-huh. to inject raw packets, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And the goal was to develop that the same kind of tool for GSM and then for 3G and then for mm-hmm. other protocols. Like right, um, right. Much in this, yeah, like you said, to make things actually safer, right? I mean, that's yeah. That's always the thing that the first time I remember like being exposed to the security industry, I'm like, why are they doing this? It feels like it's so like malicious. And it's like, no, you have to have attack tools to ha- make defense tools, basically. Yeah, I mean, we, if, you, if you look at GSM, some of the attack that we uh, demonstrated for uh, like real, I mean, they were known for a while, and, yeah. but 
nobody, okay, yeah, with the everybody, everybody right? the, the response was uh, always, okay, yeah, but it's not doable in practice. You, you can't, it's a theoretical attack. <laughs> right. Or you can't pull it off unless you have a gigantic budget or that kind of stuff. Right, right. And then, like, uh, it's basically, a, someone's screaming, hey, hackers, come try this right now. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, we prove, okay, we can listen to a phone call with, like, a $25 mobile phone of which we've replaced the firmware. Wow. You know, how much cheaper and how much practical do you need yeah, exactly. so that you fix exactly. your stuff, right? Yeah, right. Uh, that's yeah. Stuff. that's great. Man, this has a lot of uh, security implications, I suppose. It's yeah, yeah, it does. And, um, and of course, the, uh, besides the security, there's also just uh, making technology uh, just more available where at places where, sure. where it wouldn't be uh, because right. sometimes operators don't have uh, like the financial incentive to provide coverage in that's right you know if you have a huge area to cover but not many subscriber mm -hmm. uh, you might need a solution that is much cheaper than what you can buy from Ericsson right. for instance right, so, right. and if it's accessible and people can yeah. you know it's not necessarily easy but it's accessible and like people can learn their way into the system yeah. and stuff like that yeah that's great I think there was I think it was actually more on the fiber side but there was like people setting up ISPs and like like downtrodden communities and like some of the inner cities of the states that like no one was gonna I think it was Detroit maybe it was like nobody was gonna give them service there maybe it was even cell service too I don't remember. yeah uh, I mean um, I've, at least I've heard it for the self service uh, for the cell service sorry um, in some places I I don't remember the specifics but it was like in the in the UK or something like mm -hmm. a, like a, a particular zone like the, there would be no coverage and the, no operator would be interested and so they had to provide cell service, cell service for themselves right. basically right right um, yeah because they're still commercial enterprises it's not like national yeah and it, it's always, it's like it's in, in, the, in the UK it's not in in like a, you know yeah, Sub-Saharan Africa yeah, with exactly. like yeah, it was it's a huge area to cover that right, kind of right. Stuff. it's still uh, like a somewhat decent uh, uh, yeah you, what well, you would expect you know Somewhat decent uh, population density, I should finish yeah. that thought, not somewhere yeah, decent no, no, place. Yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. Somewhere, yeah, where you would expect cell service to be a bit more, yeah, right. basically. Yeah, right, um, Yeah, I don't remember the details, but it was an Osmocom uh, talk at some point. Yeah, uh, that's great. That's, I mean, like, that's, that's a feel-good project, too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's great. Well, what else are your interests these days? I mean, what else are you... I mean, not, oh, you worked on the uh, cube too with uh, Peter, right? Uh, yes, yes. So, yeah, the uh, LED cube, I should say. Sorry. The, uh, I mean, it's basically the Ice Forty Dev Board. Um, how did I come to work on that? Uh, Peter what? bugs you, and he bugs you, and he. Yeah, but I don't remember. Oh, yeah, I meet <laughs> Peter. Like that's that's the question. I don't maybe remember. Maybe Congress a couple years ago, maybe. Did I meet it in my Congress? It's possible. I don't. This is Peter Azentemski, who we've had yeah, on the yeah, show yeah. before. He's our. Uh, our, our uh, roaming correspondent at Congress. I think I'm going to try and talk him into recording again this year. So we'll see how that goes. But anyways, yeah, I mean, basically I was working... Oh, yeah, no, I remember. It was... Um, <clears throat> I was uh, on uh, the Open FPGA uh, IC channel, mm -hmm. and I was trying to get... Uh, I was working on my USB stack, actually. Okay. Oh, no, no, I wasn't working yet on my USB stack. I was trying to get the... Uh, tiny, uh, so Lux Valenti, tiny FPGA yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. USB thing, uh, working on the UP5K, the the, the Ultra Plus uh, uh -huh. FPGA, um, because before I saw that project, I didn't even imagine for a second that I could implement USB with just FPGA IOs, right? With right. just that, like they wouldn't be fast. And, I, and, I, and, and so I, I found the Lux Valenti project like uh, amazing, but it wasn't targeted at the FPGA that I had. Um, and so I wanted to get it working on that, and um, I came to discover the Icebreaker uh, Bitsy board, which is actually a yet unreleased board that Piotr uh, worked on, um, and yeah, acted so that uh, I managed to, in the end, I managed to get it to run, and I saw a couple of streams that... Uh, Peter did, uh, we tried to assemble that board and, and make it work, that oh, kind right. of stuff. Yeah, and yeah. I think I met him at the Congress afterward. And he started the Icebreaker um, board. And he sent me uh, like a prototype, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I. Uh, that was actually at, uh, at Supercon last year. Yeah, okay. that, that, was, that was at Supercon last oh, year. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, no, I remember because uh, I didn't have any LED panels before, and he, he had a couple with him, and mm -hmm. uh, I, he, he gave me one and the uh, associated P mod, and I just basically started working on a, uh, a LED driver using 
as reference because I had no idea how to drive those either. Yeah, right. right. And so I watched a video by uh, Mike Harrison, mm -hmm. which explained how to like a binary coded modulation and uh -huh. how to drive those LED panels. Yeah. And because those yeah. things are like, there's a ton of LEDs on those things. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there's a very specific way to drive them efficiently, basically. There's a ton of ways you can drive them, but there's only so many ways you can drive them well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and yeah, I basically developed um, a, a core to drive that that was generic enough that apparently a, a bunch of people decided to use that oh, great. to yeah. drive uh, the LED cube. Oh, so cool. I wrote the... Is that what Greg De Devil's using too? So yeah, Greg Devil uses a heavily modified version okay. uh, because his, his LED panels don't really look like up 75. Yeah, he right. had to do a bunch of hacks. Oh, that's right. So he's, yeah, you were, you were uh, these are the off-the-shelf yeah, yeah, multicolor exactly. panels that you guys were working with. Yes. And then he developed his own... He developed his ones. own uh, method of driving them, um, like optimized for his form factor and his custom um, thing. And so he had to, he took my code, modified it. Okay. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think he uses it in also in not his cube is um what is it? I, I, yeah. yeah, that 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 thing. It's like it looks like a twenty six <laughs> sided die pretty much. I don't okay. know what the I don't know what the true shape is. It looks like a yeah. Okay. Yeah. This one, um, I think he uses an even more modified version of it because okay. yeah, <laughs> that's not square whatever, anymore. Whatever works. Whatever works. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. But yeah. No oh, cool. And so. To go back to the USB thing real fast. Yeah. So you said that you couldn't use. So like I think about. You know, microcontrollers I use, they have transceivers on board. Those are effectively differential special inputs, right, that are taking in USB signals well, and the, then translating those, right? The thing is, like USB, you know, um, so low speed and full speed, mm -hmm. which is all we support on the badge and on the, the sure. thing, yeah. it's not really different. I mean, it's differential in the sense that most of the time the signals are opposite of each other, uh -huh. but that's only most of the time. Uh -huh. Like sometimes they're both slow. Yeah. Okay. So it's not true differential, and you don't actually need a differential receiver. You can just look at each signal oh, independently. Oh, I see. Okay. So you just take one pin and you say, well, if I can detect a high and low, I'm fine. Yeah. I mean, usually, usually you take both and you de you detect uh, all four just, state possible, yeah. which is both zero. Right. In transitioning. Both, both kind one of... is an error condition that shouldn't happen. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and then you have uh, the J and K state, which are like uh, one is DP positive and the other is negative. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. And so you do. You okay. extract those three states from there. Okay. Huh. Okay. And then, so then that's enough, though, you're saying that you didn't need specialized hardware. Exactly. Uh -huh. if, if you want to go to, like, uh, the high-speed things, which is, like, 480 megabits, uh -huh. uh, there you need true differential receiver, and you need also a PHY because, I mean, 480 megabits, uh, like, you can't, you can't do that with... Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of fast. It is it's fast. Kind of <laughs> and so you, you need a de dedicated hardware yeah. um, that... Translate that. So it's usually like a ULPI fee, and then you, uh -huh. that deserializes essentially this into eight bits in parallel. I think. Would it be possible to put USB into like a CERTAS at some point to do because it's doing a serial <coughs> to do, to parallel kind of thing? Um, I don't know. Oh, you do, do, oh, because you need to do the clock re recovery as well, oh, and I, I don't know if they're gonna do that. Okay. Um, at a certain point, yeah. it makes sense to have external hardware anyway. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, I mean, but this helps. You, to you can actually do that. You can, you can do USB three. With, this, with oh, the, okay. the gigabit status of the CP5, uh -huh. you can do USB 3. Okay. Uh, does that have it on here? Or no? Uh, no, the badge doesn't have them. Okay. It's a special... Uh, it's more it's the dash something. Yeah, yeah. dash dollars. And you, there is no <laughs> like high-speed rated connection on the sure. badge anyway. Sure, uh, right. Because, yeah. Right, you need a bunch of firmware on top to handle all that stuff too, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think... Um, well, what does this do then? So how much can it do? Uh, 1.1 can do what? Couple oh, it's, only, it's, it's twelve megabits. Yeah, uh, so that's still good for a lot of stuff, right? And it shows up as yeah, sure. I mean, uh, you can. It only it only has like nine megabyte of flash, so it's, it's not like you can you need a lot of time. Even if you if you were writing your entire flash every time, right? It doesn't take that long, and yeah. to do things like um, you know. USB console or that kind uh -huh. of stuff, it's or firmware update. It's it's perfectly appropriate. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you for telling about us all about all this stuff. This is yeah. this is. I mean, I love this hardware. It's great. Um, how? What do you think the best? So you know, you've been doing FPGA stuff for a while now. Yeah. How, what is your your favorite way? How do you think people should get started with FPGAs and then kind of oh. continue the practice? Wow, that's a really hard question. Um, that's what I'm here for. I, I ask the difficult yeah. questions of the empire. <laughs> I would actually start with either. Um, Verilog or VHDL, I, I tend 
to lean toward Verilog because uh, most of the open source tools um, use Verilog more than VHDL, so you, you will have more choices. I won't lie, like the learning curve is, is rather steep, yeah. but um, I think it will allow you to go um, further, basically, um, because of all the existing code, all the right. existing examples. Um, all the cores are usually Verilog too, right? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of VHDL ones as well. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, okay. there are. Um, but yeah, I, I started you know, doing FPGA using VHDL, yeah. uh, but I switched to Verilog basically when I started working with US companies uh -huh. and when doing um, open source work. Uh, yeah, with the open source tool, I mean. Um, so yeah, it's it's not necessarily easy, but at least you won't be limited. Yeah. Another good option would be um, NMyGen. Oh, yeah. Uh, which is basically using Python as uh, auto description language. Uh -huh. um, so that's kind of a taste thing. But at least it, with NMyGen, you won't be limited either. Um, yeah. It's, it's really new. Like, I think it's version 0 0.1 has been released okay. like, yeah. uh, not so long ago. So documentation is probably not... Um, great at the moment um, so uh, yeah it's is there a good project kind of that you usually tell people to start with that <sighs> not really a good project is whatever is going to keep you motivated yeah, I think right, you know right. choose something you want to do uh, that would be for instance like kind of hard to do with a microcontroller but sure. that you heard yeah. would be easy with an FPGA that's a good point um, yeah, usually already, driving is probably a great example of that yeah word. exactly exactly yeah. because uh, if you want to do it um, like perfectly or like fast uh, and fast parallel kind of stuff. And, yeah. it's, it's tight timings that are really deterministic that kind of stuff yeah. which is hard to guarantee on a sure. uh, microcontroller right. interrupts the and, thing. Yeah, and, and, and <laughs> exactly and, yeah. and, and like trivial on a FPGA so that's yeah. really a very good project um, and it's not it's not too hard it's easy to simulate uh, and that's actually the other thing that I would recommend for people is yeah. learn to simulate first. Yeah. Like, you I mean, say use iVerilog for that? I, yeah, I use iVerilog for that. Uh -huh. um, people have had good success with uh, Verilator as well. Okay. Um, yeah, I've not used either of those. I've, I've, used, I've used the Model Sim in the past, but... Yeah, I, I but use Model Sim as well, yeah, yeah. right, but yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's expensive and most likely for a lot of projects, you know, if you're simulating a giant FPGA and you need to simulate like billions of cycles yeah the speed advantage of model sim makes sense for, yeah. but if you're simulating like a driving in a LCD panel for a few milliseconds it yeah. really doesn't matter yeah um, and yeah simulate 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 because uh, debugging hardware inside an FPGA well, I have one LED I could blink, so that helps, right? Yeah, <laughs> it helps. Uh, I mean, connecting like a, a logic analyzer outside is, and, and on the, on some bigger FPGA, you can actually instantiate like an internal logic analyzer. Yeah, yeah, I've seen those. But uh, the tools to do that with the open source uh, are not yet as convenient yeah. as the open source uh, tool chain. And then depending on the FPGA that you use, like the S40, it's such a small FPGA. Yeah that it would consume a lot of resources. Yeah. Um, simulating, on the other hand, it doesn't cost you anything, and um, you can inspect every single signal in your design yeah. at any point in time. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty trippy. It's, yeah. it's really great yeah. um, to debug stuff. Yeah. Great, all right, well thanks for joining us today, I appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah. All right, we are back at Supercon 2019. We've been interrupted a couple times here, but we're, we're gonna get it this time. Phew. I'm here with Matt Venn. Matt, how you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. So um, you do FPGA stuff. Yeah. How did you get into that? I got into that through a interesting technology strategy board uh, grant, which is like an English system that the okay. government makes available money uh -huh. to do projects. And I was working for a company at the time called the Arcola Theater, which also had like a technical incubator attached to it. Really? And they were doing hydrogen powered stuff. Really? Okay. Theater lights. Yeah, it was quite the it was, hydrogen powered theater lights. Yeah, like the, the that director very and, far afield. Yeah, yeah. The director of the theater at, was a like did a PhD in hydrogen fuel cell stuff. So he was like interested in looking at the merge between. It sounds like someone who's like I've got money and I'm spending it exactly how I want to. <laughs> no, they never had money. Well, I mean, some kind of grant money though. Yeah. He was like interested in the world of like super controlled engineering uh -huh. and how everything takes a long time and is very controlled and then also like theater. The theater where <laughs> like 
it doesn't matter if it's not ready. You the have show to must go on. Then. Right. Yeah. And he was like interested in looking if it was possible to kind of do a merge of those things. I'm glad that there's not hydrogen fuel cells that are just well we'll figure it out yeah. it, it has to go so we'll just blow that stuff up. <laughs> yeah right right <laughs> so uh yeah actually you overheard when we were talking with ted earlier but um this was for a a project to detect if a um a high pressure tank of hydrogen was being damaged through being filled yeah. by listening to the sounds that it makes right um yeah you're doing like filtering and yeah. much application and detection. uh that guy, that project was being worked on by another engineer who had to leave due to health reasons, okay. and he uh, said, asked if I could do it, and I was like, "Yeah, sure, why not?" Yeah. And then I had to kind of learn how to do everything, take over from that project, which at the time was a beagle bone and an FPGA uh -huh. together, um, listening to ADCs, and so that was like my first. That's a, that's a deep end dive right there. Yeah, and it was uh, okay. I did that totally classic thing of coming at it completely from the software side and uh -huh. thinking it's like each line of it was VHDL. Oh, and sure, it was sure. like a sequential program. That's right. And oh uh, yeah, just and then uh, I don't know how to like. So I've been you know I've had two other guests on so far, and I'm not sure what order I'm going to post them in. But yeah. um, it's hard to like try and it's like you can't, you don't know the matrix until you see it you know what i mean like it's like it's really hard to to remember what it felt like before understanding that switch over you know it's hard to explain that to someone yeah you just have to kind of do it a little bit and have you ever uh worked with kids uh doing computer programming i have not no okay there's this um software system called scratch by okay MIT. i've heard of that yeah. heard of that so yeah. that's quite interesting cuz in the uk with the uh new um, computing curriculum mm -hmm. is like this sequence of software that kids often use and okay. the classic thing is they start on Scratch and then they move to other things and okay. end up in Python or something okay. and with Scratch everything is happening in parallel you make a new really? I didn't sprite know yeah. and then you give it some instructions and it starts doing and then you make another sprite and you give it some instructions yeah it's like the incredible machine kind of thing right? Where it's everything is going on at once yeah. and it's just very very simple and straightforward and then they transition to Python, and they want to make something like they've done in Scratch with things happening at the same time. And so they should switch like, to FPGA, as you're saying? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> wow. But, yeah, so then it's interesting that, like, Scratch works in a very parallel way. Yeah, in Python, right, you right. have to work hard to make things work. Like, you need to use a library like Pi Game or something right, like that right, to right. get some multi-threaded stuff going on. Yeah, and then wow. I didn't with know that. electronics, I started with you know, firmware and C and doing yeah. everything step by step. And then with FPGAs, it's like, no, it's actually like someone's given you a huge bag of those one by one by one Lego yeah, blocks. Right, and you right. can make anything you right. want. Or a lot of 74 series logic. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Um, like uh, Pepin, who did the, um, he did the, uh, the little LED blinky that was, wrote the Verilog and then synthesized it to 74 series logic. Oh, and then built that right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. that's great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's t I mean, it's just a tough mental switch. I think. I think it's tough for kids in general, just because the abstraction kind of yeah. stuff that's happening in ways. But yeah. Um, okay, so that's how you. That's the first project you got into, or that was the first exposure I had to FPGAs, and oh. that was before the open source tools. And got then it. Okay. that project's like being it's a kind of R and D ongoing project. Okay. And then I made the switch to using the open source tools, which for me was great because. Um, like you, I work kind of in a, uh, it, I want that really tight feedback loop so yeah. I can learn quickly because yeah. I learn better through application rather than textbook. Right. Yep. And having a 30 second synthesis to bitstream to yeah. programming. Right. Even though you're not really meant to do it, like that with FPGAs, <laughs> you're right. meant to simulate, we should probably to test think pages, through and things, yeah, blah, 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 yeah. But, um, yeah, it's good to have that very fast, and that's what makes it possible for the, you know, the badge hacking workshops, the open source tool, like, because you can install this stuff, it only takes up 100 meg or something, and then yeah. you can run that whole process in... Well, the tool chain takes up more than that, right? Yeah, probably. I was it's just thinking, I download, well, I downloaded the um, badge hacking toolkit. Yes. That was 300 meg. Yeah. Tar GZ. But compared so. to, like, a, you know... Yeah, a, and that includes the RISC-V tool. tools. So. Right, right, yeah. 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 Hmm. So it's that tight feedback loop that I think is uh, helpful for... Uh, when you're beginning, but then right. as things grow in complexity, then you've got to learn how to do the simulation. Right, right. Otherwise, you're going to crank. Uh, it's just horrible. Time. You end up in yeah. FPGA hell, as yeah. Dan Jizzlequist calls it. What, uh, what, what is FPGA hell? It's where you're 
uh, your design doesn't work and you've got no idea why not. Oh, you're waiting, you're like cargo culting it. You're like, well, if I touch my ear and yeah. I hold my elbow like this, yeah. then, then it works this time, yeah. otherwise it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, that's... That's tough. I think any kind of thing where it's like a new a new field like that, you're just trying to figure out what works. You know, sometimes it really helps to have that working example to start from. But you know, for new projects, you just don't don't always have that. You know? No. Yeah. So you made the switch to open uh, open uh, tools. Yeah. And which we've obviously been highlighting a lot here. But now you also work on symbiotic EDA. Yeah. So that was um, that was just. I mean, that was just a kind of. Lucky coincidence, really, because yeah. as I was doing more stuff with the FPGA stuff and with the open source tools and following Clifford and the other guys involved in developing the tool chain, I would like sometimes see some tweet that they'd written about fixing a bug or some th new thing or some documentation or whatever. And I was stuck on some problem. And I was like, oh, I'm going to go back and search. And you know how awful Twitter is to find anything that's happened yeah, like, yep, yep. even five minutes ago. Yeah. So I was searching through Clifford's tweets and then saw like a, a job offer posting Wow. For like, we need more people to get involved in the FPGA yeah. stuff. Right, and we should say that's Clifford Wolf yeah. who started the OSIS project yeah. and now runs Project Ice Storm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Ice Storm. Sorry, yeah, that's it. Yeah. So I um, yeah. I applied for that, but it was like a year and a half of, like out of date. Oh really? Oh wow. <laughs> but they said, oh, we need somebody to help with the education and the workshops and the trainings. Yeah. And um, although I do uh, like quite straightforward engineering stuff, I'm also uh, really interested in science communication yeah. in general. So, same. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> um, this is a really good opportunity because I can work with a team of absolute FPGA masters and learn a lot from them. Yeah. And and when I think it's a, I think it's it's a bit of a cliche, but people say you know to learn something you have to teach it. Yes. And I think um, like certainly with the formal verification side, like it's taken me, I don't know, like six or eight months to feel like I can explain the concepts of that. Okay, you have 30 seconds to go. <laughs> so how, what, what is formal verification? Oh, you put me on the spot. Oh, now. totally, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so formal verification is uh, a different way to verify your, um, your projects, mostly FPGA because it's, um, for it to work, you need quite a limited space of opportunities for things to happen. Right. So with an FPGA design, you've got limited width registers and limited things, things the state, like the total number of flip-flops in your design is mm -hmm. small compared to right. like a Python or C program where every, like in Python, you make something, yep. you make a variable and it's actually an object and it could be a 64-bit float and right. it's like just huge yes. what it could encompass. All the values that it could yeah. Yeah, hold in there, yeah. Um, and then how that propagates through the system. Yeah, here, right? so if you're like r testing like a C program, you might like write a test bench that exercises it. And it yeah, it, 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 but it has to be like a strategic and smart. Yeah, kind hopefully. Of, but yeah. it depends on uh, the imagination of the person that writes the test that's bench. That's right, yeah, yeah, that's the smart think, piece yeah. of it, yeah, yeah. Whereas formal verification works in a different way. It's like you say what would be bad for you a bad state to get into uh -huh. and then you give that whole thing to something called a sat solver uh -huh. and the sat solver's job is to find a way of uh, like progressing from an initial state to a state that is broken that yeah. violates your properties and if it can do that then it kind of wins and it writes you out the trace of how it got there huh. and then so fail and then yeah. you open up that trace and that's cool because I'd actually did, I'd not, I'd, I had not the way I'd remembered it from I think when Clifford was talking about it, maybe after that even, was the idea of you try you could try every combination of every bit in your entire system, or there's a subset of those bits that will cover everything, and so you just do that instead. But that doesn't sound like what you've just said. I think it's related. It's, okay. Um, but it's like this sounds like a constraint that you're putting on the system. Yeah. So there's there's a few different ways. Like um, you have your properties. Uh huh. Um, like your safety properties where you say, I assert that this thing must never happen. Okay. And then the solver, the SAT solver, will try and find a way of getting your design into that state. Huh. And if it can, it will write out a trace that you can then load up and it's usually very short, which makes it easy to trace your bugs. Then right. you fix your code if it's a bug. Or you might think, yeah, but my code could never have got into that state got because it, that's it. kind of outside the... And yeah. then you would limit your search space oh. by using a different operator. That so the SAT, SAT solver, though, how is it actually... Is it just varying input, like, randomly? 
I can explain how it works. That's still like the magic okay. side for me. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's okay though. I mean, like, but it's doing something that yeah. is getting it to that state. So yeah. So the, one of the examples I use when I'm explaining it on like the videos and stuff is I, I use a Python library called PySMT, which is just like a wrapper for these SAT solvers. Okay. And you can do something like the example I use is you take the letters in hello, H E L L O, and the letters in world. Uh -huh. W-R-O-L-D and you say to the SAT solver if you assign them all a value from 1 to 10 yeah. in those letters hello and those letters world and they've both got to add up to 25 and they've both got to equal each other okay. can you come up with a way of assigning the numbers that satisfy those constraints okay. another classic one is like solving sud sudokus you, know, you give it these certain oh, things those puzzles I don't yeah. like those and then it will go away and it will find it will find if it's possible or not. But the interesting thing about them is they never come back and say, I don't know. They say either yes or no. Huh. There's no kind of in between. Like it, you yeah. might decide Cause to. Because you get to the end yeah. and it's like, you know, I've tried everything. That's not possible, right? Maybe it's, there's too many combinations and it is just, it's running for three or four or five days and you decide, okay, I need to limit my space a bit. You stop yeah. that job and you change it a bit and you run it again yeah. but it's never going to come back and say no there's no right. way but and actually there was state. a way right. Yeah. Right. so that's the kind of the power of the formal tools is right. you can say like um, we used it recently in this uh, machine learning accelerator which has got a single ported uh, memory uh -huh. with a pipeline to control the kind of accelerated multiplications and it was important that you can't read or and write to the, the single ported memory at one time uh -huh. so you can just write one assertion there you just say I assert that only one or the other of those lines can be true at once. And that's all you need to do. Then you run the formal tools on that, and then it will try and find any way at all to give the input to the pipeline in a uh -huh. way that messes it up and gets it to read and write at once. So and if it says no, uh -huh. you're guaranteed that your design is good in a mathematical way, a mathematical certainty, which it would be very yeah. difficult to get that kind of certainty from a test bench right. because... How could you test every combination? Of course, of course, right. And it's like the test bench is like, well, your input is now five. Yeah. Your input's now, you know, or your input's five from five to twenty-seven, right? Yeah. You could say that as like a, a test bench. Yeah. But I might not think to make my input blank. Again, it's or like it might up be, to the imagination of the tester. Yeah, but right. if you've got something with too many combinations to test, and you'll never get all the corner That's cases. Right, right, right. right. Huh. But there's things that it's no good for, like um, multiplication. Again, that's not something I can explain right now. Sure. That's like on one of my ongoing Got a, questions. The, the TBD, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like be able to explain that. Yeah. But much better to do something in like with Verilator or like C++. You write something that just exercises the, the entire space, checks all the inputs and mm -hmm. the output is correct and run it and it takes 20 minutes to the, test. Verilator is the Verilux simulator, right? Yeah, it's like, a, it's like a C wrapper for simulating your Verilog code. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, this is definitely hard to wrap my head around. But yeah, you should watch my videos. I I've watched one. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, well, here's I guess that's a good question. Then Wh who would be using this? I mean, like, so is this chip companies and you know, like uh, industrial companies, like people who needs to use formal verification? Well, I think um, historically it's been people that can't tolerate failures. Okay. So space shuttles. Or, or when the failures are too expensive. So if you. Mm -hmm build an ASIC and I was talking to an ASIC engineer recently and they were like one of the things that it terrifies us is that we build a state machine into the ASIC that ends up getting stalled or blocked oh. and then there's no way of unblocking that and we have to do a new spin yeah, in the new, ASIC new mask, a yeah, huge yeah. amount of cost on that yeah 10 million dollars yeah yeah um, so people like that where they've got this huge investment or like you said, like space or aeronautics or right, stuff right. like that. No coming back from yeah. it kind of thing, yeah. And typically the price of the tools is reflected like that kind of niche yeah. area. And the one thing that we're trying to do here is, as well as the tools being open source so that you can download and compile and start using them at no cost, yeah. we're selling uh, licenses that kind of come with the, the backup, the technical support of... Yeah. Yeah, it's a service contract instead yeah, of a that software kind of thing. contract. Yeah. yeah, and or being able to buy um, online hours, so you oh, can try so you it out quite cheaply. It. Yeah, like yeah. Uh, I think the cheapest license is maybe a thousand dollars a month. 
probably a lot cheaper than a former oh, God, tool. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. unbelievable. How it much sounds so niche are. and so like important that I can imagine yeah. six figure type of. But I'm yeah. It's, I think there's um, there's a lot of room for people that have never heard of it uh -huh. or have heard of it and think it's too hard or yeah. have heard of it and think it's too hard and it's too expensive. Yeah. And um, it's, uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's another valuable tool in the toolbox to at least know it's there and occasionally use it. Yeah. I don't, like, I think also some people have the impression that you have to, like, formally verify everything or nothing. But, right. again, you like, you, and, yeah. you, a couple of properties in the occasional file to like the bits where you're confused or you think what's going to happen if this I just can't work out I'll just write my one formal property that says the state machine must never get to this state yeah okay so let's run with that example real quick I know that this is a stupid question before I even ask it but like there is no stupid question there's a stupid question I'm about to ask it um how long would that take? <laughs> now, I know that that's a stupid question because that's an undefined what, problem, right? to write right? or to run To the... run it. Like, so you said sometimes they take three or four or five days, right? But maybe like, let's, this... let's constrain the problem, yeah, okay, right? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. So we've got an ECP5 badge, right? Yeah. I want to have the state machine example you talked about earlier. Yeah. How many inputs could it even have? Like, how long would that take to simulate that or to verify that sort of thing? Uh... It's really an open question because you can have <laughs> yes, you can have um, uh, like a proof that can run in seconds and be done. Okay. Um, because because uh, there's only like a couple branch points that could yeah. Like if you imagine you have like a register sure. and you're saying this register must never equal zero and you set it to one when the program starts, yeah. but then there's no logic in the um, in the design that would ever set it to zero. Oh, right. Then okay. The, 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 the formal tools would just immediately see there's no way of it ever being changed and just be like, finished, it's done. Huh. But if you had that as, say... Like the output of an ADC or something. There's a 16 kilobyte block RAM yeah. and the out, the, when you're reading an address, the output must never be more than 200. Yeah. Then that's a different problem. Yeah, and you've got to kind of approach that in a bit of a different way. Yeah, so I know that this is going to lead me back to asking you how it works under the hood, which I realized yeah. you said was a thing that... You're still, still a bit magical, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it, like, it feels like it's like almost like a sensitivity analysis. The way you've talked about it, it's like almost a sensitivity analysis of like, like you're how talking about what could change, like how, like how powerful is this knob that you're trying to test, right? So uh, sensitivity analysis, the way that I think about it is you kind of back calculate to say, I want to know if I turn the knob for, yeah, I don't know, voltage gain, yeah. right? How much does it change the output way, way over there? Right. And if it changes a lot, the sensitivity is very high. If it changes a little, sensitivity is low. Yeah. And it sounds like it's that, but then back calculating it for all of the digital and the stuff. combinatorial stuff. Yeah. Which is why the which is why I think that the multiply stuff is more difficult for a formal proof. It, whereas there's so many a state machine is easier because there's only a certain number of ways of transitioning I from see, state to state. So you talked about constraining the problem space then. yeah what did you call that yeah so like this the search so if your design has got a thousand flip-flops in it yeah so it's got that combination of all those different so if you looked at all the possible states your design could have it would be two to the a thousand uh -huh. so it's a really big space yeah but if you can uh, constrain the space that the solver is working within then yeah. you can also make things work faster so you can use this as a keyword an operator called assume, where you can just say, for the sake of this pro problem, assume that this entire area of the state is never going to change or is always going to be like this. Okay. And then it will only ever consider. So do you ever start tests where they're so constrained that you know it's going to be super short? Well, that's one of the... Uh, that's one of the... Um, uh, the dangers is for like for example you could say okay I've got my property set up the state machine must never enter this state here and, and you've got an assumption that says um, assume reset equals high and then actually your design never moves forwards because yeah. the reset is always high and the, yeah, the design yeah. can't change so the tools will finish immediately and say your design passes right. and you go woohoo I'm yeah. getting beer yeah. but actually you made an assumption that prevented your design from ever working right so that's um so the, the formal tools aren't some kind of magic bullet. Yeah. They're only as good as the properties. And yeah. to write good, well-meaning properties that cover the important stuff is the work of 
getting to be good at using the tools. Huh. But there, it seems like there's a balance point between like something that is super under constrained and it runs forever and super over constrained where it finishes nothing. Immediately. Right, yeah. yeah. So how do you strike that balance? I think um, that's, again, part of the... This is what earns you the big bucks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if, you can, if you can answer that question. Well, it's, yeah, knowing what stuff is the important stuff to test and how to test mm. that. And sometimes it's very straightforward what yeah. the answer is. Like in the example I used earlier about the, um, the memory access, because um, I, like, I, I could do a lot of work on how the, um, the bit that dispatches commands into the pipeline works but actually the only thing I care about is that the read and the write line are never high at the same point mm. so I just put one asser assertion there and then if there is a bug that leads me to the problem in the dispatch okay. for the pipeline mm. but then other designs are not that near straightforward to work out what properties you need to fully understand it like to, f to formally verify a FIFO uh -huh. Uh, there's like a few different things you've got to do. You've got to like say that um, when you make a read at a certain address, then a certain bit of data goes in. When you make a write, uh, then the the data ends up inside the FIFO, uh -huh. and then it it doesn't get lost. And then there's a little bit of kind of construction you need to do. Like sometimes you have to build a state machine that uh, handles the formal testing of oh okay of another state machine so mm. that different assumptions or assertions are made depending on the current operating state. Yeah. Well, that's good. I mean, it, I guess, you know, it's not like, I don't think anyone listening to this ex expects FPGAs to be a panacea, you know, like to like solve all digital no. problems. And, and I, But I think tools like this also make it a little bit more accessible as well, right? Because yeah. you can run a lot more tests. And, and this is honestly what people are doing when they verify like an ARM core as well, right? Like that's just kind of all pre-done for you. ARM, someone at ARM is running similar you testing, I'm so, sure. yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah, I actually don't know. Yeah. <laughs> is, yeah. that, is that a thing that they do? Um, I don't know. I well, know. maybe a better question is who, who are your clients? Well, I had a great conversation um, with a guy who works at um, a particle accelerator in the States. Oh, cool. Just trying to remember. Is it uh, Fermi? No, it's um, ALS, Advanced Light Source. Mm. I think that's it. Um, and they used um, Clifford's Pico RV32, which oh. is the same thing I've got two of in their, yeah, that's in right. their conference yeah. badge. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I was interested in, I'm interested in big science anyway. Yeah. And I was asking, like, what, like, why did you choose this? And was it important that it was formally verified? And they use it for the interlocks for the RF safety system. I think he this. might have mentioned this when he was on the show. Right. There was someone there was someone at a particle I thought it was CERN, but maybe yeah. it was someone he also they're used in CERN. They're used at CERN well, too. Yeah. Okay. But the guy that I interviewed was in oh, LS. Great, great. Um and yeah it it kind of gave them confidence that by using a formally verified oh, processor to control the safety features of their accelerator yeah. gave them confidence that it still was going to do code the right thing. It, yeah, <laughs> the code could still mess up. Just yeah. saying. You know. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But I guess that's one less thing you have to worry about. Of yeah. like weird bugs yeah. happening and stuff. Yeah, like and that. having it open source means that you can check it for yourself. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. that's yeah, definitely. A, well, I mean, uh, are there other people out there that should think about? Do I guess I kind of already asked that though. Huh? I would say that. Um, uh, if you're getting started with uh, the FPGA stuff, mm. then... Hold off a little bit. <laughs> um, well, you're going to uh, probably just immediately want to get your hands dirty, like yeah. I did, and yeah. like do a bunch of examples, and you load them onto the FPGA, and you're taking a bit of the cargo cult stuff, like you mentioned. Yeah. And then stuff's going to stop working, and you're going to be an FBA, FPGA hell. Got it. And you're going to... Uh, you're going to ask somebody and they'll say, well, have you simulated the design? What happens when this happens? And you'll say, no, what well, simulation? And then yeah. you'll have to learn how to do simulation. And I, mean, I would say... Down the rabbit hole you go. Yeah. At that point, uh, then it's also worth checking out uh, some basic formal verification stuff because the tools are now free to experiment yeah, with. Yeah. And um, one of the... They're 
they can help you accelerate the time to find and fix bugs. So, you know, like test-driven software developers. Yeah, right, like, that's a great You write your test first, yeah. and then you write the, so you write your formal properties first, like when this thing happens, then this thing must happen. Mm. Then you write your Verilog, and you run the formal prover, and it just says, no, it didn't work. And then you, you get your trace back, and you're like, oh, yeah, because if, if reset's high when that's low, then it can end up in this state, ah, and then you write that extra bit, and that yeah. stops that, and then you run it again. It fails again, and it says, oh, yeah, because if it was in this state when the bus was like that, then this is going to happen. I write the thing that does yeah. it. And then it passes, and you're like, okay, cool. Now I've got a bit more confidence. And so you probably do simulation too. as well. Yeah, well, I, I used to just simulate FPGAs, actually, back in the day, but it was yeah. always very visual. And that's interesting, too, because this is decidedly not visual, right? Well, it can uh, be, I'm sure, it, but it's, it's visual if, um, do you mean like looking at waveforms? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's visual when uh, it fails because then it writes you out your trace. Yeah, goes, I meant more like looking at charts of yeah. highs and lows and highs and lows and highs. Yeah, because that's, that's uh, you know, if you've got like um, like 100 megabytes of traces right. and you've got your bug in there somewhere, yeah. that is that can be really yeah. eye-watering yeah, like, right. to work your way through all of that. So yeah. one of the things I love about working with the formal tools is that I'll probably all my traces will be 20 clocks long and it will just go from a running state to a failed state, mm. and I can just see how it happened. Mm. What is a trace? I guess I don't know what that is. Um, a trace so is like the, the steps that it's going through? Yeah, yeah, like imagine, yeah, so it's like um, each waveform shows you the state of the flip-flop for mm. each of the flip-flops, and you could like load all of them at once and see how the state of the, the design is changing all the time, but mm. maybe you just have the clock, the reset, what state the state machine is in, mm. what is going on on the data bus, and you see these things changing as the design huh. progresses through. Okay. So you run your simulation, and it dumps like a, a VCD file, value change dump, uh -huh. and then you load that up in a program like GTK Wave, and that's got all the the traces. The stuff that I'm used to. The, yeah. yeah. Looks like a logic analyzer. Yeah, 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 that's what I was thinking. Okay, yeah. okay. That's cool. I call it traces, but... Yeah, that's, that's cool. That's cool. Well, uh, where can people find out more about this stuff? Um, for formal verification, uh, you can get in touch with me, Matt, at symbioticeda.com right. to arrange a demo. Demos. If you want to do like a, a demo, um, if you don't want to do a demo but you want to watch some videos, check out and subscribe to our YouTube oh, there it channel. Is. And hit that bell. Hit that bell. <laughs> ding, ding. <laughs> Search YouTube for symbioticeda. Symbiotic EDA. Um, I'm just, I just published my second video i did like a series on how the open source fpga toolchain works yeah and now i'm doing a series on like an introduction to formal verification i Great. just published the second one working on the third one awesome so um yeah and we've got a webinar coming up in one week time i don't know when this is going to come like up webinars but you know you don't like them I don't. I don't, like, I don't like the word, honestly. Like, no, the, no. like the idea of like someone like being there, like teaching me, like transferring knowledge. I just wish it was a different name. Yeah. Like webinars. Never like the name. Yeah, I agree with you. We're trying it out. I don't know how well it's going to. We think we've got maybe thirty like, or forty people registered like so far. Like live video lecture. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we've got a live video lecture. Oh, I'm so interested. Yeah. Yeah. You can sign up. Yeah. Um, on our web list. Yeah. On our, on our mailing on our, list. Yeah. On our web tweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. And that's going to be like uh, me and Clifford Wolf talking about getting started with the formal tools. That's great. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, man. You're welcome. Thank you.